All right. All right. So, um, so my name is Thomas Kingreen, and I'm a social worker with Avenida's uh, Rainbow Collective in Palo Alto. I'm, I'm the program coordinator for that program. Um, and at, at the Avenida's Rainbow um, Collective, we, we provide um, social services, um, social engagement, and um, educational opportunities to the community um, with the focus on LGBTQ seniors. Um, and we service um, Santa Clara County, as well as parts of uh, San Mateo. Um, so I wanted to thank you all for joining us today um, and to um, commemorate uh, World AIDS Day. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, you guys see that? Yeah, okay. All right, so what is World AIDS Day? Um, World AIDS Day uh, started in 1988. It's the first global health day, um, to, to, which is used to observe um, the, the progress that we've made on um, the AIDS epidemic, uh, not only in the US, but in the whole world. Um, um, and it allows an opportunity for people to um, come together to to fight the epidemic, to remember those who we've lost to the epidemic, and to support those who are still living with HIV today. Um, so today's uh, presentation is called 2020 Vision, Ending HIV and AIDS. Um, so today's presentation should take um, roughly um, an hour and a half, maybe two hours. Um, I hope that's not too long. I did put a definitive ending point on the um, event today because I wasn't quite sure how many people wanted to ask questions and how, how long these presentations are going to be. So um, if, um, if you can't stay until the end of the presentation, like I said, I'm recording it. So you're welcome to um, check back on my website to get whatever you missed. Um, so the way that today's going to go is my, I'm going to talk first and I'm just going to do a little brief um, uh, discussion or, or talk on the history of HIV um, and how it's impacted our society. Um, then we're going to move into um, Dr. McGlynn um, from Stanford, who works at the um, Positive Care Clinic at Stanford. And he's a psychiatrist there. And he's going to talk to us today about how um, HIV and AIDS affects a person's brain and their mental health. Um, okay. And then the main presentation today is going to be from Dr. Andrew Zalopa, um, where he's going to talk about the current state of HIV and AIDS, um, as well as the treatment um, options that are now available and, um, and what it means to be undetectable, because that's very important in my view as a social worker. I don't think enough people understand. Uh, probably lower. Yeah, I'm not getting uh, good content. Okay, um, can you turn off your mic, whoever that was? Slightly lower. Um, um, uh, so, so yeah, so um, so Dr. Andrew Zalopa okay. is going to be talking about I what it means to be undetectable, uh, um, because that's very important. I don't think people understand okay. what it means to be undetectable, and, and um, they like need to in order for us to eliminate uh, yes. stigma. I'm going to mute people. Um, okay, and then finally, we're going to have Jennifer Vanneman from um, the Health Trust um, to discuss. Um, the programs and services that they offer people who are living with HIV and AIDS. Um, they offer a lot of support and resources from case management, housing, food insecurity resources. Um, uh, and, um, probably go up to 25 to like last time. Okay. Yeah. 14. Yeah. Uh, excuse me. Can, can um, you please mute your microphone? Whoever's talking. Thank you. Um, and then at the end well, of the... Uh, I'm feeling it uh, well enough there at 20. After you everybody... I think we're good. Them. You can mute them yourself. I know, I can't. I don't know how to do it from this. No, screen. I'm good. Thanks. I'm sorry, guys. One second. Um, can somebody tell me how to mute it? Does anybody know where to go on... A little okay. microphone on the bottom left, and you just click on it. That, that'll mute everybody else's? Okay, well, actually, it's quiet now, so let's... 
Right. Thomas, I think you can mute them. It's the three dots, possibly, um, on everyone's screen. You can, could possibly mute them that way if you want. Oh, I see. Okay, great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Oh. And then, so after everybody to, um, has the opportunity to do their presentations, we're going to be at, um, um, offering you the opportunity to ask questions from the panel. And um, so if you can just type your questions in the chat throughout the presentation. Um, at the end of the presentation, um, we'll address the questions. Okay. Okay, so, um, so um, HIV and AIDS start, um, in 1981, we, we got our first case of, of AIDS. And um, since then, um, we've, we've come a long way. In the, in the 80s and in the 90s, there was um, very little treatment um, to offer people who were infected with the disease. So the death toll was very high um, and the infection rates were very high as well. Um, as we moved into the 90s, we, we, um, they developed some new treatments and medications that um, were effective in um, combat, combating the, the disease. However, it was a, a lot of, a lot of uh, pills a lot, um, back then you had to take. Um, today, um, they're able to control the disease with um, just one pill a day, um, which is great for people who are living with HIV because not only does taking so many pills, I mean, I've heard people taking up to 14 to 15 pills a day back, back in the uh, late 80s and early 90s. Um, not only was that a hassle to have to keep taking pills throughout the day, but it, it doesn't do well for your liver either. If you're taking so many drugs and so many pills, um, that's just going to add to the uh, potential of negative health outcomes in your future. Um, so it's great how far we've come um, today. In this chart I created, um, I show um, the purple is um, um, people living with HIV throughout the world, and these are by the hundred, um, by the thousand. So. Um, 1981, there was um, about 500, a uh, little over, in between 500 and 600,000 people in the world infected with HIV. Um, in um, the U.S., oh, you know what, shoot, I didn't put the U.S. there, but, um, and it, people in the U.S. go in the early stages of um, HIV and AIDS, um, um, we're, we're dying um, quickly, we're at 50,000 people, um, we're, um, so, sorry, I'm a little nervous. Uh, um, were, had passed away due to HIV and AIDS. And then um, in the 80s and the 90s, um, infection rates in the world, um, people living with HIV increased. Um, and, but you see in the 90s, it's sort of um, uh, later 90s or mid 90s, it sort of tapered off. Um, and in the late um, 90s, 2000s, when we started getting the medications, you can see that the death rates, which are the orange, um, orange lines, um, are steadily going down. Um, um, so some of the um, some of the differences um, between having HIV and AIDS in the early 80s compared to today is back when you were um, diagnosed with HIV and AIDS, that was pretty much a death sentence. You know, when when you're told that, it's just like, oh my God, what what am I going to do? I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna die. My my life is over. Um, whereas today, it's a manageable condition. With treatment, a person can expect to live a full, full life um, with HIV. Um, um, back in the beginning of the HIV uh, AIDS epidemic, um, HIV and AIDS predominantly affected white gay men. Um, today, it's black and Hispanic men who have taken the lead as, as being uh, the most at risk for infection. Um, and, and I bring that up because you know, just like with COVID right now, you know, people of color are most at risk of getting um, negative outcomes or getting the disease and having neg negative outcomes from having the virus. Um, and I think this just sort of just reflects that, that um, the health disparities, not only um, the health disparities that exist between social economic levels and, and races is real. And um, this just goes to, um, to show that. Um, I talked about how treatments have changed back in the beginning. You would take up to 14 pills. Now you only take one pill. Um, the thing that hasn't changed that much is the stigma. Um, I mean, back in the beginning, 
there was a lot more. I would call it extreme stigma. I mean, you would get rejected from healthcare providers. Um, employers would discriminate against you. Um, even I've I've had a client tell me one time that at their at his work um, one time when he told them that he was HIV positive, he he went on vacation. When he came back, they had done a a training on um, bloodborne pathogen safety, and everybody's walking around with spray bottles um, to clean any surfaces that the um, that my client touched. Um, and if in the reason why I bring all this stuff up is because you know having HIV and AIDS is not just something that happens to you physically to your body, but it's something that happens to you emotionally, psychologically, socially. Um, it really impacts a person's life. Um, in extreme ways um, when they're living with HIV and AIDS. Um, another thing I wanted to point out um, about HIV and AIDS um, from before to now is the legislation um, that was enacted um, for um, HIV and AIDS. So before 2017, it was considered a felony. You'd get three to eight years in prison for not disclosing HIV, your HIV status to a sexual partner. Um, today, it is now a misdemeanor. Oops, dang it, sorry. Um, it, um, it is now only a misdemeanor uh, for up to six months in jail if you don't disclose um, your HIV status to a sexual partner. Um, also before 2017, um, it was a felony for you to donate blood, tissue, or organs. Um, but now people living with um, HIV are able to donate blood, tissues, and organs. Um, and before 2017, you can be convicted of the felony of not disclosing your status to a partner, even if you don't infect them, even if no, nothing bad happened. If they find out after you had sex and you didn't tell them, you could go to prison for three to eight years before 2017. Now um, you do have a, a defense which is um, if you intended to take or you did take precautions to prevent the infection, that is a legal defense to keep you from going to jail. Um, so I wanted to take this time to um, remember the people that we've lost um, to HIV and AIDS. And some of you sent in some names of people um, in your life that you've lost. And as I go through these, if you'd like to take an opportunity to say a few words um, about the person, um, you're welcome to do so. Um, because I'd like this to be more intimate than formal of a, an occasion to where people can use today in this moment to truly remember the people that they've lost. Um, so we've got Jim, Const, uh, constant hairdresser. Did you want to say anything, Connie, about Jim? Well, <laughs> this may sound funny, but um, Jim was one of the early um, deaths from it. And people didn't know a lot about what was going on and, and uh, he had been both a hairdresser but a friend too and for a number of years and I, I do will always remember the last time I saw him and he looked so decimated and withered and weak and I just remember giving him this big hug and thinking I know it's fine to give him a hug even though people were really sensitive about touching a person. Um, I didn't feel that at all. So um, I guess well, that's all you. I have to say. Thank you. And Daniel, uh, did you want to talk about Judd today? Yeah, just wanted, and thanks so much for the opportunity and for gathering us here in community. Just wanted to send my love and affirmations was a friend um, in some of my early 20s years in San Francisco and really is just a great person and I think really embodied um, a lot of the qualities that I aspire to be. So his memory lives on and I appreciate the opportunity to give affirmations and honor him. You're welcome. And then Paula, would you like to say a few words about Paul? Um, sure. Thanks, Thomas, for this opportunity. So <clears throat> Paul and I were Paul and Paula in high school. We were actually high school sweethearts. And I always think back to the fact that I think the best boyfriend a naive girl can have in high school is a gay man. And we were just, uh, he was just a wonderful friend, became a great family friend. And we kept in touch through life for 40 years and then the last year of his life we went on a cross-country road trip together 
it was when he called me and told me he had AIDS. And so um, I was in DC, he was in California and he came to DC and we went across the country together and kind of really talked about our lives as adults. So Paul always had a beautiful smile and a song for everybody and I miss him every day. Thank you, Paula. And, uh, Bob, you have a few friends that you've lost. Would you like to talk about one or all of them? Or all of them, actually, I'd like to talk about all of them if you have the inclination to do so. It's not, it's okay, you just pass. There it goes, okay. All right. Well, thank you for the opportunity, uh, Thomas. Uh, I'll just talk about uh, Jerry uh, Zerbel. Um, uh, we met in the uh, 80s and David, uh, uh, until he died. Um, he died in 1987. So uh, in your chart, he's one of the people that uh, uh, went rapidly. Um, he was a, um, what do you call it? A, um, uh, a recovery, uh, surgery recovery room uh, nurse. Um, uh, he was from Iowa. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, interesting fellow. He was six foot six, and I'm only five nine. So <laughs> <laughs> it was quite a, and, and he was skinny, you know, uh, like I'm skinny. So anyway, but he liked to, uh, we'd go out to, uh, you know, uh, a normal restaurant, not a gay restaurant like in San Francisco. And he just enjoyed being outrageous uh, to my embarrassment. <laughs> <laughs> and I was always trying to tone him down because he was doing it to uh, rub his gayness uh, in, the, in, the, in the face of people around him, whereas I was just the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he, uh, he died um, um, of uh, PCP. For those who remember, that's uh, pneumocystis carinii pneumonia, uh, which uh, there was no treatment. They treated with the African sleeping drug um, uh, sickness cure, uh, which had no effect. And like you were relating earlier, uh, uh, he was a nurse and he was staying in Mills Hospital in, in San Mateo. And uh, it was like an isolation room they had him in. Uh, yeah, all the nurses were going up, uh, going in gowned and masked. Like people are dealing with uh, COVID today uh, in treatment, treating their patients. And so he felt, uh, you know, like uh, he was a, a pariah. Uh, so uh, anyway, that's my uh, recollections of Jerry. We had, uh, you know, some good times together, even uh, while he was, uh, before he got PCP uh, the third time. So. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to talk about Jerry. He didn't publish his, um, his uh, obit anywhere, so he, he's one of those people that uh, sort of just disappeared. I was there in the room when he died. <clears throat> he wanted me to do that, so I was there. So uh, thank you for the opportunity. Well, thank you, Bob. Thank you very much, and thank you for being there for your friend. Richard. Um, you, you have David Perez and Kelly Melville, your best friends. Would you like to say a few words? Uh, yeah. David and Kelly were lovers and um, we spent, I was married at the time, so the four of us spent an enormous time together as just really, really good friends um, David passed away first and, and Kelly a couple of years later. Um, it was kind of interesting. I went to the AIDS quilt showing in DC in 96 and we looked up Kelly and it was a little um, heart wrenching movement when that happened. And so we decided to go look up David Perez and we found David Perez, except it wasn't Kelly's lover. It was my third cousin, David Perez. So actually when I have David up there, it should have been put two Davids. Um, I had just met my third cousin, David, a couple of years before he died. And um, it, it, it just, 
it, it was very touching to see his quilt and to see Kelly's quilt. Um, they read Kelly's name out right before I found his quilt. So it was like a double whammy, like you hear his name and then you right. see his quilt and right. like, okay, let's take a break. <laughs> <laughs> take a breath. <laughs> Thank you. Thank for you, Richard. Showing this. Yeah. Um, and then this one is mine. This is my father. Um, when my um, parents uh, split up, he moved to Oklahoma. And um, uh, soon after that, uh, we found out that he was positive. Um, and, uh, you know, part of the stigma of um, HIV and AIDS is pretty sad, you know, because it's self-imposed stigma too. You know, my, my dad, when he was dying in the hospital, I went to Oklahoma to see him, but he wouldn't let me see him because he didn't want me to see him so deteriorated. Um, and he wanted my last memories of him to be of a healthy person. So I miss him. So, um, so my little part of the presentation, I just wanted to point out that we've come a long way since the beginning of the epidemic in, in our society as far as treatments go. We still have a long way to go as far as stigma um, goes, you know, and, and Dr. Zalopa, I think, is going to address a lot of, of ways that we could combat that stigma with, through knowledge, um, compassion, and understanding of the disease. Um, um, and um, I just wanted to encourage you all to um, you know, listen to um, Dr. Glopa, Dr. Um, Glenn, and really take in what they have to say. And, and if, if you're not familiar with uh, uh, HIV or AIDS on a personal level, like you don't have it or you don't know somebody who has it, um, this is a really great way. Op this is a really great opportunity for you to not only become more aware, more knowledgeable, more compassionate, but it's also an opportunity for you to help combat stigma um, because with this knowledge you have now after today, when you get your little AIDS pendant, AIDS ribbon pendant that I'm going to be sending you, um, in my mind, you know, that, that, that pendant shows your support for people living with the HIV and, and the, uh, you're, you're a partner in the, the struggle to combat and eliminate um, AIDS um, entirely. But it also um, gives you an opportunity for when somebody says, oh, what a nice pendant. You can use that opportunity to, to educate that person. Um, let them know what you learned today. Um, because stigma is, is a product of ignorance, right? People, people fear things they don't, they don't know. And it, you know, people living with HIV and AIDS, their challenges and struggles are already hard enough. We don't, you know, we don't, people don't need to make it harder for them by, by um, continuing um, the behaviors of, uh, associated with stigma. So anyway, um, I'm gonna uh, stop sharing my screen and give the presentation over to Dr. McGlynn, um, if he's ready to go. Yep, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great, let me uh, share screen. And first of all, it's so great to see all of you here. It's, um, you know, those of you who are, um, Fans of Dr. Zalopa, I'm sure. <laughs> those of you who are in my support group, those of you from the community, Becky Moskowitz, man, she's like the powerhouse attorney who's fought for all of our patients in such a meaningful, powerful way. And um, oh man, just a whole bunch of you here. So great to see everyone. I'm going to keep my presentation short. You, those of you who have, who have. Um, had the misfortune of being in some of my presentations. I talk a lot and I'm gonna definitely make this short and succinct because I think really um, a lot of this is about um, sort of treatment. So uh, looking at HIV in the brain, um, really as HIV enters the body, it gets into the central nervous system very quickly um, through a variety of mechanisms. We won't look at this in particular, but this kind of just shows a little picture of how it affects certain nerves, nerve cells, um, astrocytes, um, various immune cells that are in the brain, but causing this kind of disruption, this inflammatory process that though a person can become undetectable, sometimes, which is our goal, sometimes the inflammation kind of continues and, and that, can, that can continue to lead to mood changes, anxiety changes, um, and some of the other things that we focus on in HIV neuropsychiatry. The brain becomes the sanctuary for viral replication People who live longer, as 
as patients with HIV do, uh, may, show, may show signs of CNS um, pathology, um, even though they may be undetectable out in the bloodstream, you know, where we would check their uh, labs. So at the top of here of this pyramid, HIV-associated dementia, Luckily, we see less and less and less of this because the medications work so well. Go down another level here, minor neurocognitive disorder. This is where a person um, may start to notice uh, symptoms. They may have some complaints about not focusing as well, not performing as well at work or in school, um, maybe trouble with typing, things that they used to be very good at. Then there's subclinical or asymptomatic neurocognitive impairment. These are people who, if we tested them with neuropsych testing, you know, a variety, a battery of tests, we would pick up some deficits. But if I ask them, how are you doing at work? How are you doing at school? They're like, fine, everything is normal, everything's okay. We call those asymptomatic. So of all the people who are living with any kind of neurocognitive impairment with HIV, most of them are asymptomatic. Um, uh, people who are living with no neurocognitive impairment, that represents roughly half of the population, depends on uh, of population of people with HIV. Also, though, it depends on which clinics we're looking at, where we are in terms of levels of poverty in that clinic, levels, levels of substance use in, the, in that group, et cetera. So, but in general, we estimate half of people with living with HIV are going to say, I'm doing good. I am not having any problems at all. What are some of the symptoms of a person who may have neurocognitive disorder from HIV? Some may say they may not remember things as they used to. Um, they they um, have to remind themselves of what one needs to do on a regular basis. Um, they may find themselves sometimes lost or disoriented. Um, difficulty focusing attention. Um, difficulty solving problems, maybe it takes longer to make decisions, they might move more slowly and more awkwardly, um, possibly sudden emotional changes and frequently being irritable with little reason. Um, they may, on the other hand, feel apathetic and withdrawn from others. Um, how do we diagnose this? Well, we use uh, neuropsych testing. In some cases, when we don't want to put the person through a whole battery of neuropsychological tests, we may do a screening. This is a, um, one of the questions that might be present in one of the screening tools. I might say to the patient, okay, I want you to clench your fist in, in, in um, your hand into a fist, put it down on the surface, number one. Number two, Make that fist flat on the surface with the palm down. Number three, flip it perpendicularly. In other words, flip it to the side. So you start with the fist hand down, flatten that fist out, and then hit the side of your hand on that table. You do this as many times as you can, um, as fast as you can, and then we count how um, the person performs at that. This is, just, this is a test of a person being able to figure out you know, this, this sequence, but also physically being able to do it. Other tests may appear as simple as this. Look at the picture and tell me which animal these are. Name the animal, you know, the lion, the rhino, the camel. But that takes a certain amount of brain processing to do. Visual, they have to take it into their memory banks. They're like, okay, that's a lion. Now I have to repeat that. I have to say that word. So it's a good test for things, you know, how well the brain is functioning. So it's not all about HIV. Um, there's a whole lot of other things that go into how is a person functioning when they are living with HIV. Some people may um, indulge in alcohol or methamphetamine, um, and these clearly have a detrimental effect on a person's ability to focus, to function, when they're, especially when they're living with HIV. Um, we also, when we're seeing a patient who may be complaining of changes, neurological changes, we want to look at the other medications they're taking. We want to see, are those contributing to any changes or are there drug interactions going on? So this is part of our work as well, to look at interactions, side effects of the meds that they're taking. Treatment. This is where Dr. Zalopa is going to uh, speak afterwards. The treatment for HIV-associated neurocognitive disorder is really the treatment for HIV. We want to reconstitute the immune system with antiretrovirals.
There's some other um, adjuncts we might add in there, psychostimulants, you know, some people may be put on Ritalin or Dexedrine. We might want to treat depression, uh, agitation, anxiety. Lithium sometimes has been um, helpful in some cases. And some studies have shown that SSRIs, those common antidepressants, may be neuroprotective in the brain. In particular, they focused on the use of Paxil, paroxetine. Um, and so more studies are going on um, with that. Um, finally, I just want to wrap it up with uh, another stigmatized illness that can also contribute to neurocognitive problems in HIV, and that is syphilis. This is a, a, an illness that we've seen for a long, long, long time. And back when it was introduced in Europe in the late 15th century, highly stigmatized. There were special hospitals that were established in the Italian peninsula that oftentimes targeted affluent women who were too ashamed to seek out medical treatment from their regular clinicians. So the stigmatized illnesses that we've seen for a long time that lead people to go into hiding, understandably, because they might be rejected by the communities where they would normally find their support and their love and their caring and their, their lives. Um, but, um, but in some cases, people were so stigmatized that they um, simply committed suicide back in those days. This reminds us, though, about Tuskegee. Tuskegee, for those of you who don't know, was the, were these, um, this period of time where African-American men in particular um, had uh, syphilis, were infected with syphilis, and then they, but they weren't treated for it. And scientists were watching to see what happened to people who were untreated with syphilis. So this kind of established uh, a lack of, of um, confidence, of trust in the medical community, uh, in particular, which continues to these days in the African American community. So it, it kind of brings up the question of, um, for African Americans, how do they feel about treatments that are available in the medical community? How do they feel about COVID vaccinations when those come available? Um, and I think overall, it just sort of um, um, I guess brings us to the point of saying, you know, we really have to listen to those people and their concerns about treatments, whether it's in HIV, syphilis, or as we're looking at the coronavirus uh, pandemic, um, how will people approach uh, this, the idea of vaccination as we move forward? So that's it. I thought probably a good idea at this point is to save all of our questions till after, after Dr. Zalopa speaks. Um, let me turn off my screen share and, um, and I would, I guess I can pass it on to Dr. Z. I would, I could say that Dr. Z was, was really instrumental in my coming to Stanford. Um, I came out and interviewed from Boston and, and this was my home. And then I got to meet Dr. Z and, and the staff at the clinic at the positive care clinic. And, and I just fell in love with it, with the patients, with the community, um, with the doctors and nurses, et cetera. And so I, I really looked at Dr. Zalopa as a true friend and, and someone who, as he started the services, has really been there from the very beginning um, in terms of the care of the community with HIV. And I look, I see Eric Evangelista down at the bottom, are, are one of our nurses from the very beginning um, of the clinic. So um, anyway, Dr. Z, I hand it over to you. Uh, and thanks a lot, everybody. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. And thanks for the nice presentation and the introduction. Um, I'm not sure exactly how to share my screen. I, I think maybe Thomas, you can um, put up the slides if you don't mind. And um, there's a green box. There. Oh, you got it. Okay. But uh, I do appreciate the opportunity to to speak with you folks today on World AIDS Day 2020. It is hard to imagine, and as I was listening to um, you know, some of the uh, names that we were commemorating, um, it reminded me, it took me back to the time when we started the clinic. And of course that was um, before Dr. McGlynn joined us, but uh, back in the, in the 90s. And we, um, we had a retreat after about, oh, I don't know, the first 18 months we were in business. Uh, Robin George was the nurse. Uh, some of you may remember some of the Faces here. It's wonderful to see some of you. Uh, and uh, Seema Jane, our, our medical assistant, 
and Jan Thomas, our, Jan um, was our social worker. And we all got together down at Pigeon Point and we went through the deaths that we had in the clinic and we had 58 names on that list. So we had about a death a week in that first year, year and a half that we were, we were operating the clinic. Uh, and I don't think it was because I was such a bad doctor. It was because people were really sick and uh, those days, and you saw some of the evidence of that from what Thomas has shared with you. So what I'd like to do today is talk a little bit about what I'm doing currently, because there's some exciting stuff happening in the area of therapeutics, but to try to keep this more of a, a global kind of picture, a more of a 30,000 foot uh, view picture, and then we'll try to get into some questions. I noticed there were some questions around COVID, so I'll try to, I didn't have anything on there uh, in the presentation, but I'll try to get to that. So Thomas, I'm going to have you go ahead and push, uh, advance the slide if you would. And uh, I don't know if I could take control of that. Uh, might make it easier if I could. Um, I don't uh, know how to do that. Yeah, so I'll just ask you to do it. So there's been a lot of discussion now that uh, we're in 2020, whether or not we can actually end this epidemic. And here's just some examples from the medical literature on this topic. And for those of you, and I, you know, I know a number of you have been at this, in, involved in this, have been living with HIV uh, for you know many many decades now. Uh, how could we possibly do that? How can we end this pandemic? And of course, a lot of focus right now is on the new pandemic of COVID, but we still have the pandemic of HIV that we have to manage. So, what what do we mean by ending? the HIV epidemic. And I want to go into that today because I think we do actually today in 2020, we have the tools to be able to end the epidemic of HIV across the globe, uh, which is super exciting. So next slide, please. And really this is uh, from the beleaguered Dr. Fauci. He's been in the news a lot, poor guy. Uh, but you know, we know him. I know uh, Tony very well. He's, he's been visiting professorships at Stanford when I was there and He's an amazing uh, advocate for HIV and AIDS. And uh, here's his um, editorial in the Washington Post from a few years ago, just at the beginning of the, the current administration. Uh, no more excuses. We have the tools to end the HIV AIDS pandemic. And, and uh, he was challenging us to think about how we use those tools in an effective way. Next slide. So actually, he was able to get the Trump administration to buy into this and to put support behind it. Uh, but there's still a lot, there was a lot of skepticism at the time that this was just a PR stunt. Um, but uh, nonetheless, actually, this is a, an effort that continues today. Uh, and hopefully will continue into the new administration as well. Next slide. So I just uh, I mentioned, I, I work for a company called Vive Healthcare. I, I didn't leave Stanford because actually you can never leave Stanford. You, you know, it's like Hotel California. <laughs> uh, you can check in, but you can never leave. So I'm an emeritus professor at Stanford. I still teach and I'm still able to do things like this, which is which wonderful. But the company that I work for, Vive Healthcare, is the only pharmaceutical company on the planet that is 100% devoted to HIV medications. That's all we do. Uh, and we, you know, in examples like this, we want to partner with our uh, affected, ininfected populations to be able to accelerate the pace of scientific innovation, to develop a diverse portfolio of medications for people living with HIV so they have choices, and obviously supporting uh, and partnering uh, in the global community. And we are committed uh, to driving towards the 90, 90, 90 targets. I'll talk about that today at the, at the end. And we are committed to uh, putting ourselves out of business, essentially, which is achieving zero new infections, el eliminating mother to child transmission and advocating for treatment as prevention, as well as supporting the vulnerable communities uh, to fight HIV stigma, which Thomas has already spoken about. And I'll come back to that as well. So next slide. It begins here. You saw this actually 1981. These were a group of four previously healthy gay men reported from UCLA. Uh, Michael Gottlieb, you'll see the first author on this paper actually was a fellow at Stanford and he had just joined the faculty at UCLA. 
And there was a young medical student uh, at UCLA by the name of Andrew Zalopa uh, that got to take care of one of these four individuals as a medical student. So my career with HIV actually began at the very beginning uh, when I was uh, a medical student. The patient was already published as part of this report and other reports. He was a famous patient. Uh, but I was able to take care of that patient uh, as, as a third year medical student uh, at UCLA. Uh, so next slide. If, since that time, of course, we've seen over 37 million people worldwide infected. We have more than 35 million deaths over the course of this epidemic. Uh, there are still nearly 2 million infections each year. This is 2017, but it's not much different. Actually, it might have gone up a bit with COVID. Uh, uh, we, we don't know because testing has fallen off quite a bit. Uh, and uh, we're still seeing about a million deaths around the world uh, due to this epidemic. So it's not gone away. And even though COVID, uh, rightly so, is taking most of our attention at the moment, this pandemic is still uh, very much uh, alive and well and uh, unfortunately leading to a lot of death in people. Next slide. And this is just to remind you, when I opened the clinic at Stanford in 94, HIV AIDS had become the leading cause of death in young adults, 25 to 44. We were all in that age group, judging from the looks of the folks on the call that I don't know and knowing people that I know on the call and knowing where I was, that's what age group we were in, 25 to 44 in that, in that era. And uh, you see a very steep incline as, as in the red line there. And then with the advent of effective therapy, almost equally steep decline, uh, although it still remains a top 10 cause of death in young adults uh, in the US. And that, that has been more and more concentrated in the Black and uh, Latinx uh, communities, as, uh, as was mentioned by Thomas. Next slide. That's uh, for overall, but here's for women, and you can see that uh, we have peaks and the drop-off wasn't as, as complete because women uh, were not, especially uh, Black and African-American uh, women, were not, didn't have the same access to care. So they didn't get the same benefit. This, the, the, the steep drop-off wasn't quite as steep, and you could see that over the next decade of having effective therapy, it still remained the top three causes of death. So the, a, a maldistribution of life-saving uh, support and medications has been part of the stigma uh, in the HIV uh, that we've seen from the beginning. So when they talk about differential death and COVID, I think all of us know that story very well because it was written in HIV and AIDS uh, decades before COVID. Next slide. So here's the whole list of medications. And actually, this is even out of date from last year because we at Vive have just uh, licensed and approved a new medication, that's Recobia, Fostemzivir. I'm not gonna talk about that much uh, today. Some of you may actually have been talking about it with your doctor. It is a type of an entry inhibitor. We'd fall under the category of Maraviroc down there, but it's, uh, it acts by a different mechanism than Maraviroc. Uh, and it is for people who have highly treatment resistant virus, who from all these medications still can't put together a complete regimen that can suppress them. So an important uh, addition, uh, but for a very limited number of, of people. But I'm very proud of the company for putting that together. It was given up on by a previous company. Uh, they didn't feel there was enough uh, market uh, place for it. Then Veve took it over and we saw it through. We had to actually develop uh, two plants in Italy to make the pill uh, under special circumstances. And uh, the, the, the company committed to doing that because uh, these uh, people who are highly treatment experienced and are still dying of AIDS, uh, need new medications that work by different mechanisms, not just a Me Too medication. So uh, that's off the list. Uh, next slide. And of course, all of you that are on the call here know this because you're living, uh, in many cases, uh, those that, that I've known as patients as well as, as friends, you're uh, living a longer life than was ever expected because of the advent of therapy. So. Uh, here's an example with, uh, from the UNAIDS. Uh, if you're, um, your potential survival when you're uh, 25 years old is 60. You've got 60 more years ahead of you. Next, uh, if you just push the button again, Thomas, we'll see it for what it used to be and back in the bad old days for HIV-infected individuals, 2000-2002, uh, you had eight years ahead of you. So many of those deaths that we were talking about uh, earlier were people that were in their 
twenties and thirties and forties, uh, young adults. Next, next slide. Uh, next push. Yeah. So then you can see with the uh, advent of triple therapy, so-called heart therapy that that starts increasing. We have people on average living 36 years beyond uh, 25. Next slide. And then it comes to 51. And then if you just push it again, Thomas, you'll see that it's uh, maybe there's one more here, I think. Uh, maybe not. Nope. That's it. So we're, I think what you can say is that with therapy, uh, we have pretty much, if you're on therapy and you started early before your T cells are dropped, you can pretty much um, have a normal lifespan. Uh, the quality of that life can be quite good, although it does appear that HIV infected individuals have more complications, uh, more other problems that we would consider non age related conditions, heart conditions, strokes, diabetes, metabolic issues, etc. Some of that may be related to the medications, by the way, but some of it also probably has to do with HIV, even when it's well controlled. Nonetheless, most of the cohorts today would suggest that if you're uh, become HIV infected today as a, as a 25 year old person, your life expectancy is essentially normal if you start therapy and you stay on your therapy. But despite all that progress, uh, next, uh, next slide, uh, Thomas, there are still unmet needs for people living with HIV. And uh, next slide actually points to that because I think uh, Thomas, you, you talked about this and one of the exciting things that Viv is bringing forward is a long acting treatment that does not require daily pills. And uh, when, you, when you interview people living with HIV, you can see that many people are interested in having a, a, a therapy that controls their HIV, but they don't have to remember to take a pill every day. And if you take the next slide, uh, you'll see uh, where some of these people who are living with HIV have reported challenges. Many of you have faced these challenges, the constant reminder of your status, uh, being identified, the stigma associated with it, hiding medications from family members or from roommates, uh, and uh, that, you know, even travel. You know, we've heard horror stories of people having their HIV medications confiscated at the border. So stigma still obviously exists and people still have challenges around having to manage a, a daily pill, even though it's now much, much simpler than it used to be. Next slide. So that's where the long acting program came in and uh, we are anticipating in January approval for the first long acting therapy to manage HIV and that's the Cabinuva or Cabotegravir plus Ralpivirine, two different medications, one's an integrase inhibitor, one's a non-nuke reverse transcriptase inhibitor that are in a long acting form that is taken by an injection in the gluteal region. Has to be done by an HCP. So you come into the clinic, you get your two shots, one of each, CAB and Ralpivirine, the two separate medications, one in each cheek, and uh, you're good for a month without any further treatment. And uh, that has been compared to the standard, which of course is daily therapy uh, in a single tablet. And so if you go to the next slide, I just have the very top line results. I didn't want to go into too much detail here, but just so you know about it, because this is something that's going to get a lot of attention and treatment. And then shortly after that, towards the end of the year, we're going to start seeing more and more about use of this in PrEP. So you basically here, you're talking about an oral lead in. So you're given the oral version of the Cabinuva or the Cabotegravir and the Relpivirine as tablets for the first 30 days to be sure that you're able to tolerate it, no allergic reactions, all the kidney, liver functions, et cetera, are happy. And then you go into the injection form of the medications and you get your initial injections, which is a slightly higher dose, uh, followed by monthly injections, which is a slightly lower dose. And you continue those two injections each month uh, indefinitely. And we have data now in some people that have been out for five plus years and have uh, done very, very well with the long-term injections. Uh, next slide. And these are just the top line results from the studies. I'm not, again, I'm not going to go into great detail, but the ATLAS study, the FLARE study, uh, and, it, and, it, and it, every other month dosing schedule, ATLAS 2M, is also being tested. So initially, we anticipate that it'll be the monthly injections that are approved by the FDA, but then we plan on filing additional information this coming year supporting every other month. So just six injections a year, and that's the Atlas 2M results. But you can see that the results here, 90 plus percent of people are maintaining viral suppression out at one year and beyond. 
uh, with this uh, injectable form of treatment without any other uh, pills. Next slide. Uh, and again, I'll just uh, make some comments here. The flare data is in people who were naive to treatment, put on an oral therapy. In this case, it was a, a Trimec, and then randomized to go on to the long acting after being suppressed on the Trimec. The ATLAS study is probably more related to people like you know those of you that are on treatment now that they're basically treatment experienced patients could be on any kind of regimen as long as they didn't have uh, resistance. Uh, to the components or, or, or any uh, failure in the past it had to be suppressed and then they were switched over to the, the long acting. That was the ATLAS uh, uh, trial uh, design. So basically you have to be suppressed on oral therapy before you move into these long acting uh, uh, treatments. Next, uh, next slide. And then the final comment I'll make here is that uh, injection site reactions or ISRs are common. You know, you're getting an injection in your uh, gluteus intermedius muscle, which is between the gluteus minor and the gluteus major, a little bit of an anatomy lesson here. But for the most part, 99% of the time, these are mild or moderate, and mostly it's pain. And you can see that the people having it, typically they complain more about it in the first couple of injections, as you'd expect, but then as they get used to the injections, the number of people noticing the pain diminishes, but it always is around 20 or 30% of people reporting it. Very few people in these trials, less than 2% discontinued the injections because of injection site problems that they just said, I, I don't want to do the uh, injections anymore. So very rarely that people have to come off because of injection uh, issues. And that's been pretty much consistent all the way across all of the phase three uh, clinical trials for the program. So really good news there. Well tolerated, high levels of efficacy and uh, alleviating people from having to manage a daily uh, pill for their Medicaid, for their HIV uh, uh, support. Next, next slide. And that's just, again, the injection site reaction stuff. So we'll go, we can push it again. And if you ask people that are on these trials, if you ask the participants, you know, here's the question. Over the past 44 weeks, you've been receiving a long-acting injectable uh, every month. Today, We'd like to compare your experience with long acting versus your old medication that you were taking before, which one you would prefer. And I don't think you have to be an expert in statistics to see that 98% of the people, 523 out of 532 that were asked, said, oh, keep me on the injection. And only 2% said, oh, no, I prefer the daily oral. So clearly people were motivated to stay on these uh, injectable forms uh, of, of therapy. Next slide. And if you ask them in the case of Atlas 2M, do you prefer the injectable? This is every eight weeks versus oral. Again, 98% said, give me the injection. And if you ask them, okay, if they came from every four weeks, how was it four weeks versus eight weeks? As you can imagine, the people preferred having fewer injections, uh, the eight week injection schedule, 94% uh, of the time versus the four week uh, injection schedule. So. Uh, Highly, highly uh, well accepted, uh, this, this injectable therapy. Uh, next slide. And so the long acting program here, which is the first, uh, we will be the first, but other companies are working on long acting forms, uh, helps with issues around fear of disclosure. It's, uh, you can see here some of the quotes, less and less stigmatized because they can go in and get your injection and leave less adherence anxiety you know they don't have to worry about forgetting their pill and uh the daily reminder issue as well not having to live by that sort of that that, that clock if you will so we we feel that will be a, a big advancement for people living with hiv and it gets to the next uh, section here which is uh, about how do we how do we get to zero uh with the hiv epidemic so that's the next slide uh, well, this is just a summary, I guess. So high satisfaction, low at adverse event rates, and uh, people uh, had a good responses overall in terms of their viral uh, responses. Okay, so if we go to the next slide, this is what I was talking about. We know that treatment, treating HIV effectively acts as prevention. So not only does it help people who are infected to live longer and live healthier, but it prevents them from onward um, and uh, it's been shown, and this was a science uh, article breakthrough of the year, the HBTN study, I'll show you in a moment, the design, 
was 96% effective in reducing uh, the uh, infection in heterosexual partners. This was done in primarily in Africa. Next slide. This uh, HPTN study. And this was the group. They were two groups of couples, serodiscordant couples, again, heterosexual couples. It could be the man infected or the woman infected. It, that wasn't, uh, that wasn't uh, restricted. Randomized to either starting the therapy in the affected couple right away or delaying until at that time when the uh, guidelines suggested they should, the infected person should be on therapy for their own health. That was a T cell dropping below 250. And you can see in the next slide here that this was, this was wildly successful, that if you put the person on therapy, they basically stop transmitting their infection to their, uh, their sexual partner. And, it, and with long-term follow-up, uh, five years later, uh, that, that uh, preventative effect of therapy in the infected uh, person remained uh, to be the case, no linked infections uh, in people that were stably suppressed. This has been replicated. That was a clinical trial, the HPTN study. That was the science um, study of the year. But it's been replicated now in, um, uh, in, in, in cohorts. The next slide, if you go, go ahead, Thomas, you, you went to it already, that's fine. The partner study, the opposite of track. These are tens of thousands of couples that are having um, condomless uh, anal intercourse. Uh, th and this includes a, 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 uh, MSM uh, population, zero linked transmissions, zero. So highly effective if the positive partner was on therapy and suppressed, uh, pretty much guaranteeing no transmission uh, to their sexual partners. Next slide. Again, just another study showing the same thing. So we have, a, we have very solid evidence that, that being undetectable, it means you're untransmittable. So the next slide actually is that U equals U concept. Uh, undetectable equals untransmittable uh, has been taken up by the medical community. And it is another reason why we want to get people on therapy. It's, it's better for their own health, but it also prevents onward transmission. And that gets me back to the long acting program we're talking about, because obviously if people have problems taking their pills every day, they're not gonna be undetectable and they will transmit. So having a long acting injectable form of therapy could be a very important tool in helping reach this idea of uh, getting to a zero uh, number of transmissions. Next slide. Now on the flip side, I've been talking about treatment as prevention, treating the HIV infected person to prevent onward transmission. What about PrEP? And many of you are quite aware about PrEP or you know, know people that are on PrEP. And it has been shown, Truvada here, the, the blue pill, has been shown that it's uh, over 95% effective in preventing HIV acquisition uh, if you take the pill every day. Next slide. The problem is that when you look at all the different studies, and here's just a long list, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna belabor, excuse me, but some of the studies had very high rates of efficacy, generally in MSM populations, usually white MSMs, and less effective in other populations, including women, uh, heterosexual women in Africa, where things did not work as well. So you can see the efficacy rates uh, kind of stair-stepping backwards uh, in a way that was, was not statistically uh, meaningful. There was no advantage to taking it over a placebo. Uh, so we had very mixed results, uh, partly related to adherence, the ability to adhere, but partly I think also related to stigma. Uh, if you're an African-American, uh, if, you know, so if you're an African woman, heterosexual young woman, and you uh, are taking a, a pill to prevent you from getting HIV, you're stigmatized as having HIV uh, in, that, in many of those cultures. And so you'll hide it or not take it or not take it effectively and end up being uh, infected. Next slide. And this is just to show this that, you know, you can see the dots here that cross that, that dash line at zero means they, they weren't effective. Uh, so whether it was the voice trial or the fem prep trial, daily Truvada, compared to placebo was not effective at preventing HIV infections in women, not statistically so. If they were in stable heterosexual relationships, like in the partner study or the TDF2, you can see the top three, then it was effective. 
And presumably that was because the women were not being stigmatized by their stable partner uh, and, 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 and so were able to take the medication more effectively. Uh, there's probably other reasons as well that are cultural that we don't fully understand, at least I don't understand. Next slide. So very mixed results with the pill. And that led us to using the cabotegravir long-acting for PrEP, not with the relpivirine, so not a two drug that would be for the treatment that we were talking about earlier, but just singly, just the one shot uh, for prevention of HIV. And so this was a campaign. Uh, this was from a, a campaign in South Africa, one of the clinics. I, I thought it was pretty cute. Show us your cheeks, uh, all different shapes and sizes there uh, for volunteering for the PrEP study. And many of you may have heard uh, the results, the wonderful results that were just released last month after an early review from a DSMB uh, that really shook the world. So let, let me talk about that for a minute. Uh, next slide. That's the only picture, that's the only uh, dirty picture I have in my uh, presentation. <laughs> So this is the two studies. The HBTN is the, uh, by the way, that's the HIV Prevention Treatment Network. They were the ones that did the treatment for prevention uh, that we talked about earlier in the African uh, discordant couples. 083 and 084, so we've collaborated with the, uh, uh, with the NIH, with the Bill and, Gates, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the WHO. This is a, a public-private collaborative study with thousands of volunteers in these projects. These are HIV negative individuals who are going in to these studies uh, to prevent acquisition. And the two studies, the HPTN 083 was, the results were announced this summer. That was an MSM and transgender women. I'll show you the top line results there in a moment. And then, as I said, just last month, the early release of the data in women, uh, cisgender women, HPTN 084, the study designs are quite similar. They're compared to a placebo, and it's a sham injection placebo versus active Truvada. So they're not getting, there's no group that's getting nothing. You're either getting active Truvada tablet or a dummy tablet and active in a cabinet, uh, cabotegravir or a sham uh, uh, injection. So they get both. They get a pill and they get a shot. You just don't know which one is active. And that's the design of these studies. That's the best way to do these studies to be absolutely scientifically rigorous. Uh, you can see that, that the uh, numbers here, we're talking in the thousands, nearly 5,000 participants in uh, the uh, women's study and, and 4,500 uh, in the, in the, the um, 083. Uh, these are some of the uh, uh, parameters. I won't go into details here, but these are sexually active individuals that are considered at somewhat high risk of acquiring uh, HIV. Uh, next slide just gives you some very uh, sort of top line results uh, from that. First of all, I'm very proud to say that in the 083 study, remember this was an MSM, so we also were able to recruit nearly 13% or 567 transgender women in that study. And that was important in this 4,500 plus uh, in, uh, individuals. And you can see also we recruited well young people, 18 to 29, so high risk, high sexual activity. And also, next slide shows you the uh, gender, I mean, the, the racial breakdown. Uh, nearly half were Black or African American. And uh, we also had about, um, uh, what was that, 20 plus percent. Um, well, actually, we had Latin America, so that we had Black, Afro Cubic, uh, Afro Caribbean, Native uh, represented in the trials as well. Uh, so a, a good distribution of the risk groups that you would anticipate needing. Uh, in the uh, ethnicity, the one at the bottom there, United States Latinx uh, represented uh, just under 20%. Uh, and of course, in Latin America, it was nearly all of them that were in the study that were uh, uh, Latin, or Latinx. Next slide. And this is the results, which I think uh, really created a lot of buzz around the AIDS 2020 conference that took place virtually this year uh, from San Francisco. There were 13 infections in the CAB arm versus 39 infections in the Truvada arm in the MSM transgender group. So that equates to about a 80 plus percent um, uh, reduction and uh, was superior. So not, uh, not just non-inferior, not equivalent, but actually superior uh, results. Many fewer infections, a third less 
infections than you saw with the, with the oral Truvada. Uh, next slide. So that was the MSM and the transgender group. And uh, it was terminated early because of the high efficacy. So the DSMB review board, the safety review board said, okay, we don't need any more information. We stop. And uh, you have just one third the uh, infection rate. So um, uh, highly, highly effective. Next, next slide. But what about women? Because of course, remember what I showed you is at least in the Truvada trials, women uh, didn't do so well. It was very mixed results. And so the 084 results, which just read out, uh, actually you can see there November 5th, uh, hot off the press here, not even a month old. Uh, again, this is the design of, uh, on the right-hand side of the slide here, but just let's go to the next, uh, the next uh, slide because that, that will tell you what the headline uh, said. So next slide, please. We saw 38 events overall in the 3,200 plus individuals. Back one, please, Thomas. Yeah, so 38 events altogether. Uh, four infections in the CAB long acting, 34 infections in the Truvada daily tablet. So 90% uh, or nearly 90%, 89% reduction in infection with the long acting injected. And I didn't mention this, or maybe I didn't make it enough of a point, but when you're talking about using cabotegravir, I, I mentioned it's just the one is shot. You're not taking both the ralpivirine and the cabotegravir, you're just taking the cabotegravir, the integrase inhibitor, and you're doing it every other month. So this is not like treatment, which is monthly for the time being, it'll be monthly. It's every other month injection. So six injections a year to prevent nearly 90% versus a Truvada uh, comparator arm. So excellent results, very exciting results in women. We now, we do have from the, yeah, you, you go ahead, Thomas, you can okay, go down sure. to the next slide, please. We do have already uh, the um, US uh, Prevention Task Force recommending PrEP for people at risk. That's, this is, this is oral PrEP with a strong recommendation and we'll probably see that also being taken up for the uh, long acting injectable once it's available. Okay, so some of the tools that we have in our toolkit. Next slide. I'm gonna to try to wrap this up here in the next uh, few minutes. If we take treatment as prevention and we add PrEP, we have the fundamental building blocks to end the epidemic of HIV in the US. Next slide. So if we accept on a theoretical basis, if every person who is living with HIV was put on antiretroviral therapy and everybody who was at high risk for acquiring HIV was put on PrEP, we would rapidly end the epidemic. Which for a guy that started his career 40 years ago is an amazing thing to say when we saw all that suffering and initially, of course, we were saving lives, trying to alleviate suffer and prevent new infections. We're doing all of that, but we're also trying now with those same tools to end the epidemic. Next slide. So that's a theoretical concept that I gave you. How do we bridge that gap to actually making it a reality? And here's where I think our challenges are. And all of us have to roll up our sleeves and be part of this embracing this challenge. So here's the numbers. We still have over a million people living in the US who are living with HIV. About 14% are unaware of their infection. That is probably increased during COVID because people are not coming in and getting tested. Uh, we have nearly three quarters of a million people who have died, Americans who have died of, of AIDS over the, over the pandemic. And we're still seeing around 40,000 new uh, infections each year, mostly in young and uh, staggeringly so uh, in, in young individuals. And as we've talked about before, and as uh, Thomas mentioned, in MSM, Black African Americans uh, bearing the greatest burden of new infections. Next slide. So we know that the infection rate hasn't really dropped much despite all the advances in therapy, still around 40,000 new infections in the US each year. Next slide. That's a challenge. We know that people who are identified uh, through the cascade of so-called the HIV cascade, some get diagnosed, but not all of them. Uh, some get linked to care, but not all of them. 
Some stay in care, but not all of them. Some who are in care stay on their therapy, and even fewer who are on therapies remain fully uh, undetectable. So how do we get to a better goal of 90-90-90? 90% knowing they're infected, 90% uh, being on effective therapy, and 90% of those uh, fully suppressed, the so-called cascade of care. Next slide. We're a long ways away from that in the US, but interestingly, Ryan White programs have done a better job overall than the US um, average. So only about 60% of people in the US, despite all the resources, despite all of the advances in therapy, who are living with HIV have a suppressed viral load. The number in individuals who are supported by Ryan White programs is actually quite, quite a bit higher, despite the fact that generally speaking, patients that are in Ryan White programs have fewer resources, generally uh, uh, poor, uh, you know, social economic uh, challenges. Despite all of that, it shows you that having comprehensive wraparound services that are provided for Ryan White, like the mental health services that Dr. McGlynn had provided for many years down at the Positive Pace Clinic in San Jose, do make a difference. Comprehensive care, comprehensive uh, treatment, having social workers, having case workers, having outreach workers, having mental health services, having uh, physicians and nurses involved in the care makes a big difference. Next slide. So we're moving very rapidly to, in many places, San Francisco in the lead, like it often is in, in regards to health policy, to treat all uh, and treat it rapidly. And that's the in initiatives in San Francisco. Have they borne any fruit? And the answer is on the next slide. Yes, look at the numbers dropping. This is the number of new diagnoses in San Francisco up through uh, 2017. Sorry, we don't have more current data, but I think right now, well, actually before COVID, just before COVID, uh, San Francisco was on track to being under 100 new cases a year. And all of you know how much sex is going on up in that city. So that's an impressive <laughs> figure. Uh, in and of itself. All right, next slide. <laughs> All kinds of sex going on up in there. <laughs> uh, Cuomo, uh, as he's been showing leadership with COVID, also showed leadership with AIDS, and he wanted to roll the same kind of program out statewide, not just by the city, but so New York was the first to embrace treat all and treat rapidly with rapid initiation of therapy. Next slide. What's happening in New York? You'll see it on the next slide. Also, numbers dropping quite substantially. Still uh, a ways to go. Next slide. Now, I've mentioned that we have what I would call demographic hotspots. If you're an African-American, you're only 13% of the US population, but you represent 43% of all new HIV diagnoses. So clearly, your representation in the HIV epidemic is over three times the national average. And of course, uh, most the majority, 60% of those are MSM, and 75% of those are under the age of 35. So this is young black MSMs. That's the demographic. Next slide shows you that there are also geographic hotspots. So here's a little geography lesson. There are 3,000 counties in the US, just over 3,000. Over 50% of new infections occurred in just 48 of those 3,000 counties, Washington, DC, and Puerto Rico. If you just look at that, you have over half of the new infections, the majority of course being in Black, African American, Hispanic, Latinx, MSM, uh, and uh, also transgender individuals and IDUs. And then there are seven states, mostly southern states, that also have a disproportionate amount of HIV in their rural areas. So next slide shows you the map. And here it is. You see the seven states in the light blue that are hot spots, and then the, the counties in the darker blue, which include a number in California, uh, uh, that are the hot spots that we need to target. So the idea here is to actually if we go to the next slide, Thomas, if we're trying to get to the end of AIDS, or we're trying to end this epidemic, then this is the plan. This is what uh, Tony Fauci and Bob Redfield 
and the group at the NIH uh, have have report have published on. And what they're going to do here, next slide, or what they are doing, is getting all the agencies, CDC, HRSA, Indian Health Services, and NIH organized to be able to not just target demographic, but target the geographic hotspots with the tools that we have in place in hand today. PrEP for people that are at high risk, treating all that are in infected and treating as soon as they are diagnosed as being infected. And I do believe that the long acting injectables, both on the therapy side for people who are challenged to adherence challenge and on the PrEP side will be significant contributing tools in trying to uh, reach that goal of ending the HIV epidemic in the US by 2030. Next slide. This is just to round it out. I'm almost finished now. I thought, you know, I've been very focused on the US uh, for obvious reasons. We're, we're here in California. But let me just uh, take a step back and just say what's happening globally. And I just have a couple of slides and we can open up to questions. So, you know, this is uh, the targets that have been set by the UNAIDS, the 90-90-90 targets. About 37 million people, as I mentioned, today living uh, with HIV. We'd like to know, they'd like to have diagnosed 90% of those uh, and have on treatment about um, 30 million and have fully suppressed people. I'm sorry, in the dark blue there, it's about 27 million. We are tracking well uh, towards this, but we haven't reached those goals yet. Next, next slide. Here's what we have uh, up through 2017. Uh, you see the number of people. I thought this was a nice graphic uh, from the UN's uh, data. This is all publicly available data, but I think it shows it well. You can see that we're gaining rapidly the green people, which are the people on therapy, uh, but we still have a gap and we still need to get there. So we're at about 22, 23 million people around the world on these therapies, which is mind boggling in and of itself. Uh, we're trying to get to about 27 or 28 if we want to try to reach those UN AIDS uh, targets. So we're, we're not there, but we're, we're moving well. COVID will probably have an impact here, probably is having an impact. People are not being diagnosed. People aren't able to access care. Many clinics uh, have had uh, you know, to close or had other uh, challenges that they're facing with the, with the COVID pandemic. So we'll probably see some uh, falling off on this progress, I'm, I'm afraid to say. Uh, next slide. And I'll just end with uh, another politician that I think we would rather have had uh, for the last four years. But uh, we do, I think, from a global perspective, and I know that uh, the NIH, and I think all of you are committed to seeing an AIDS-free uh, generation. And actually, I hope you see from what I've said today that it's a lot closer than we might think otherwise, that we have the tools in hand today and we'll have other amazing um, uh, tools to offer people uh, to, to make this a reality. So I want to thank you again for uh, inviting me. Thank you for giving a chance to talk about these things. Let me just um, say that in terms of COVID, I've been referencing it a lot, but some of the questions you had were about uh, impacts on HIV infected individuals. It's not actually very clear uh, what the impact is. Um, the, it appears, I would just say at this time, that if you are uh, someone living with HIV and you're well, your HIV is well managed, it appears that your risk for COVID infection and risk for severe complications of COVID are no different than an individual who is not HIV positive. Now that's not written in stone, but that's how the data seems to be trending. That's not to say that you can't have severe COVID if you're HIV co-infected. In fact, you can, particularly if you have those other comorbidities that are, have been obviously associated with bad outcomes of COVID. So people over the age of 65, people that have diabetes, hypertension, uh, obesity, if you have those conditions along with uh, well-controlled HIV, then you are obviously at elevated risk for severe outcomes with, with, with COVID. So let's hope the vaccines get here quickly. It looks very promising. Uh, the, uh, the, the vaccine. And 
Pfizer and Modera, uh, I think, are, are going to be highly effective uh, 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 therapies or vaccines or prevention. Uh, so let's let's uh, let's hope for that. So uh, let me let me stop there. I've talked a lot, and I'm happy to try to um, answer any questions that you might have uh, before I before I sign off. And I I do wish everybody a good year forward. I know COVID's been a tough year for everybody, uh, and I appreciate you uh, spending some time with me today and let, letting me spend some time with you today uh, talking about, about a different pandemic. So we've got some questions for you um, here. So uh, Paul asks, um, pill versus injectable, what about different impact on digestive organs? Yeah, sure. so that's an interesting question. Um, generally speaking, we don't see any um, difference, but these are healthy people in the trials. So, you know, there may be differences in people that are less healthy. We know that if you don't take a pill, you don't see the high drug levels going through your liver. You have, you, you avoid that what's called first pass uh, through the liver. So potentially people who have liver problems might be better off with an injectable that avoids having that first pass, you know, when you absorb the pills through your gut and then you have this big bolus of medication coming through the uh, portal uh, circulation into the liver. But that's just theoretical. We don't have data on that yet. What I can, what I can say is that from a, safe, from a liver safety point of view, the injectables are just as good as the comparator standard therapies that are already uh, approved by the FDA. So there was no negative signal, but I don't think there was any positive signal either. But again, remember these are young, healthy people in these trials. Okay. Um, another question is from Richard. Um, if you are HIV positive, will that go away? Um, I'm, I'm, well, I mean, I think it, you, obviously you're not cured. So no, it's not going to go away that way. But the antibody tests that we use, if you've been suppressed long enough, it is potential, it is potential that the antibody test could go to negative. So the tests that you would use to see if you were infected would go, uh, you, it could fade away, but that seems to be very rare. Uh, generally speaking, even people who have been uh, suppressed for 20, 30 years, if you measure their antibody tests, it usually still comes back as positive. Uh, so yes, theoretically it could happen, but uh, it's, it seems to be fairly rare. Um, and I have a question. Um, I had a client talk about um, being positive and being uh, undetectable. Um, so like, do you think it's appropriate or inappropriate for if somebody were to ask another person, are you positive? Should the real question be, are you undetectable or are you detectable? You, you know what I'm saying? Like if you're undetectable and you don't, you're not required to disclose your medical history to somebody because you're not putting them at risk. Um, would you think it's inappropriate or, I mean, would you think it would be appropriate for them to still ask the, the positive question? You know what I'm saying? Um, because by just asking that question, it perpetuates stigma, right? Like it, it automatic you, because people who don't understand what undetectable means, um, uh, you could say, well, I'm undetectable, but people will still be all, well, you know, if you're positive, you're positive, you know? So what, what do you think about that as far as, um, labeling people moving forward? Yeah. I mean, this is always, um, these are challenging kind of questions, uh, Thomas. You know, first of all, I'm a big believer that you still play safe. So if it's about sexual encounters, whether you're on therapy or undetectable, issues around disclosure, I think, are private matters that have to occur between two consenting adults. But playing safe is something that I think still, you know, we should take responsibility for our sexual behaviors like any other behavior. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, we drive a car with, uh, with seat belts. We don't drive uh, cars when we're intoxicated. So, you know, having sex in 2020, especially if you're a gay man, you know, you, you follow the rules. You follow the rules of the road, and that includes playing safe. And that's true also for, you know, for heterosexuals as well, but clearly it's got to be true for MSMs. And if you're on the negative side, you know that you're negative and you, you're, you know, you're, you're hooking up or you're having partners that you don't really know that well, well, that's the role for PrEP. You know, you can protect yourself. You know, you don't have to depend on the honesty of your partner. You, you take matters into your own hands, so you become your own advocate for your own health. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yes, uh, in a perfect world, people would disclose and talk about, you know, what their 
uh, stat, you know, what their risk is to each other. Uh, but I think if you just play safe and if you're negative, you manage it in an active way. If you know you're at risk for acquiring HIV, which means getting yourself on PrEP, uh, we'd go a long ways at having uh, reductions in transmissions. Yeah, I think that's great advice. Um, I, I would like to point out this, um, you know, it's not all about sex all the time or hooking up or whatever, you know, sometimes just dating somebody, um, you know, uh, people with HIV, when they meet somebody, do I tell them I'm positive? You know, I'm not going to infect anybody. So do I need to tell them? Because oftentimes, or uh, too often, um, when uh, somebody that's positive is out looking for a date and they mention that they're positive, that's, the, you know, bye, I'm done. Um, people, you know, people get rejected. Um, well, I can tell you that I've had these conversations with a number of the people on this call today, and this is a common thing. And my advice was always the same, and they're probably going to say, boy, I remember him saying that, you know, 20 years ago, uh, which is, you know, you'll, you'll know when it's the right moment to disclose. And that is an individual thing. And sometimes the person that you will disclose to will honor it the way you think they should, and other times they won't. And that's the risk. And that's a part of life. But, uh, you know, you depend on the people doing kind of the, the right thing at the right moment. I would say that, you know, I'm not, I'm not here to tell people how to live their lives. But what I'd say is that if you're involved in a relationship where your status matters materially to your relationship, i.e. you're going to have a sexual relationship with this person, I think that's the time you disclose. Uh, and that may, you know, that may be on the first date, that might be on the 23rd date, who knows? But the point is, you know, that's to me, it's like, that's, that, that would be like a kind of a general rule to live by, I suppose. Okay, all right. Um, so Paula Wilson asks, what is the impact of excessive smoking and alcohol consumption on those living with HIV meds? Uh, bad and bad, essentially. So like Larry showed you with the methamphetamine, what we know about substance use, whether it's you know alcohol use, tobacco use, generally speaking, if it's bad for people who are not infected, it's doubly bad for people who are infected, even if your virus is well suppressed by the treatments. So when we look at lung function, for example, and people who are living with HIV, even though they're taking their pill every day, even though they're undetectable, lung function isn't as good. And there's probably damage from the inflammation, from the immune dysregulation, from the viral effects itself that never fully repair. And so then you add smoking on top of that, and guess what? Your risk of lung cancer is much higher. Your risk of uh, emphysema, of restrictive airway disease, of, of restrictive uh, interstitial disease, all are through the roof compared to age match controlled HIV uninfected individuals. Alcohol, the same thing, because you know, you've talked about it before, you're already asking your liver to do overtime to clear uh, these medications, which of course, all of them have side effects. There's no perfect medication. So your liver has to do extra work. So if you throw on top of that, you know, managing uh, to clear alcohol, which again is another toxin, uh, it's a fun toxin. Uh, it can be a very expensive habit, uh, you know, if you get into fine wines. But the point is, uh, you want to be careful. You want to do those kind of things in, in moderation. But definitely things like smoking and, and uh, you know, we've seen, you know, Dr. McGlynn and I have managed a lot of people that have been, they've managed their HIV, but they've been ravished by their other habits, whether it's crystal meth or smoking or other, or other habits. So those have to be addressed just as importantly as making sure their virus is under control. Okay. Um, we've got a question from Kate Zay. I hope I pronounced your last name correctly. Is the injectable one size fits all or is it based on body composition? That's a very good question. It is the same dose for men and women, big and small. If you happen to have a very big uh, habitus, so uh, BMI above 30, so obese, uh, it, is, it will be recommended that a longer needle be used to make sure that you get through all the fat and into the muscle, because this is not a fat, this is not supposed to be a subcutaneous injection, this is supposed to go into the muscle. But that's not the dose. The dose will stay the same whether it's uh, men or women, big or small. Okay. Um, Good question. Uh, we've got a question from um, Id and Ego. <laughs> um, when might we see approval for the use of the injectables? So the PDUFA date, the date that the FDA has to come back to us is the end of January for the treatment. 
Uh, they may give us an early Christmas gift. We don't know. But uh, we're anticipating in early 2021 that it will become available. It will be approved and then will become available shortly after that for treatment. Uh, for prevention, the, the single injection for prevention, we plan to file uh, in um, the summertime next year. And we've already been told by the agency we'll have um, a breakthrough status because of those results, those superior results. We'll have breakthrough status which would mean that we'd have an accelerated approval by six months. So probably early 2022, we could see the uh, single long acting injectable for prevention. Great. Um, Lavella asks, uh, or says, what about a cure? You know, um, I'm an HIV doctor. I I've spent my whole life doing HIV. Therefore, I am an optimist by, by, my, by definition. We had to be optimists. I'm not very optimistic about a cure. It is true. We have a couple of cases and uh, unfortunately one of the names maybe that I would mention today if you'd asked me to uh, you know, commemorate would be uh, Tim Brown, uh, the, the Berlin patient who of course passed away uh, this year with a recurrence of his leukemia uh, after being cured. He was cured of HIV. And there's probably a couple other cases, one from the UK and a, uh, maybe another couple, two or three cases. So we can cure this virus, but it takes extraordinary heroic measures to do so. There's an ama amazing amount of work going on right now trying to figure out ways to do this, to flush out the virus that's hidden so that people can really be cured of it. They don't have to take anything, you know, but Unfortunately, I don't feel that even though a lot of effort, time, and very smart people have been looking at this and working on this, that we've made substantial progress. And unfortunately, it feels a little bit to me like the HIV vaccine story, that we have vaccines that have been sort of kind of maybe a little bit, if you squint the right way with the light shining on the result, it almost looks like it could work in some people but we don't have an effective HIV vaccine and I don't see one coming down the road. But listen, you know, in a way you can think about the cab uh, prep as a vaccine. It's six injections a year. It's not just a one-time deal, so it's not perfect. But basically every other month, six times a year, if you got an injection, you pretty much, you know, you're in that vaccine range of 95, 94% effectiveness in, in preventing HIV. And of course, most people are only at that high risk for a period of time, you know, when they're young and they're frisky, they're not settled down yet, they're not having a family, blah, blah, blah. So they don't have to do the six injections for the rest of their life, but for that, maybe that 10, 12, 20 year period, or for some, you know, that never grow up, it might be longer, but, um, you know, people do eventually settle into relationships where they don't need to be uh, preventing HIV infection anymore. So that is a kind of, if you think about it, maybe it's a kind of a poor man's uh, vaccine. Uh, but I don't think we're going to see a preventative vaccine anytime soon. And I don't think we're going to see any kind of relatively uh, easy to manage cure protocol anytime soon. Okay. Um, and so uh, two more questions and then we'll... Um... Uh, moved on to the health trust. So we've got um, Jimmy Ho would wants to know, um, will the injections ever be able to be done at home? And Stephanie uh, wants to know, how does the injections impact the kidneys? Yeah, okay, good, good. Uh, you know, Stephanie always used to ask me very tough questions uh, when, when we were in the clinic. I'm gonna save hers to last because <laughs> I won't have a good answer. Um, uh, the first, the first question was on. Um, I, I now I forgot what he, what what was asked. You, uh, would injections be done at home? Or oh I, yes, actually. So it's a good question. Uh, we're looking at all, what we're calling alternative sites of care. There'll be a whole series of these studies going on next year once the uh, drug is approved. Uh, so it won't, it, not necessarily home-based yet. Well, actually, that's not true. One of the studies will be a nurse coming to the home to do it, mobile van, uh, uh, in, uh, infusion centers, uh, pharmacies. We're going to be testing those places first. Um, 
it's a tech, it's a bit of a, it's, it's a shot in the butt, which doesn't sound like it's a big deal. And many of our patients used to do their testosterone shots at home and, you know, could manage injections. Um, but, you know, you want to make sure that you don't hit a vein. Uh, you, you, you're supposed to monitor the patient. The relpivirin, not the cabotegravir, the drug that we make, but the relpivirin that Janssen makes. Janssen is the partner pharmaceutical company in this project. You have to be careful with relpivirin because if it gets into the bloodstream, if you shoot it into a, a vein, you could get high drug levels and you could potentially have a, a cardiac arrhythmia. So we have to be a little bit cautious about that. So the answer is not immediately, but it is being looked at. People want to be able to do it. And it would mean then you have to kind of do it in a thigh, you know, like we do testosterone injections. That has to be looked at. Uh, there's no reason from a uh, pharmacological point of view that it couldn't be done. Uh, it just hasn't, we haven't studied it in that way yet. Now, for the kidneys, um, again, what I'll say is in the clinical trials, no signal for kidney toxicity. And one of the nice things about the, um, this particular combination is it's kidney friendly. You could have a person on dialysis mm. and still be able to use the injectable without any dose adjustment. Mm. And also, that's true, by the way, of the product Jaluca, which is, the, it, it's not cabotegravir, it's dolutegravir, but plus relpivirine. That could be used in people with all levels of kidney uh, function. So there doesn't seem to be any real kidney toxicity with the medications, and it can be used uh, well even in people who might have other, you know, damaged kidneys from other reasons. So, yeah. All right. So um, we're going to thank you for uh, your presentation, uh, Dr. Z. It was really informative, and uh, I think uh, people learned a lot today. Um, we're going to move on to our friend. All right, I'm going to leave you guys. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Um, and then so we've got Jen uh, Vanneman from the Health Trust um, to inform you all on all the great resources and support programs that they have for people living with HIV and AIDS. Jen. Thank you, Thomas, for that introduction, and thank you all for being here with us today on World AIDS Day. Uh, the Health Trust's HIV and AIDS services program is designed to provide vital health care and safety net services to Santa Clara County residents living with HIV and AIDS. We serve over 700 clients a year, and we are the largest non-medical Ryan White program in the county. Um, we provide services such as medical and non-medical case management. Our medical case management team has social workers and nurses on it. Um, we provide food and nutrition services as well, including access to Meals on Wheels, as well as a very large food basket. We provide emergency financial assistance. We provide um, housing pro programs as well, and we provide uh, transportation assistance as well. We also um, provide referral access for medical care, dental care, mental health services, and other community services, and we work very closely with medical clinics like Stanford, Peace, and Kaiser to ensure a continuity of care and wraparound comprehensive services. As Dr. Zalopa mentioned earlier, uh, folks who are a part of Ryan White programs are at more likely to be virally suppressed, and we have found that as well in our program. Over 90% of our clients are virally suppressed as, every, as well. Um, so that holds true uh, in Santa Clara County as well. I um, am open to any questions about services um, or any resources that we can provide um, if there are any questions. Okay. Does uh, anybody have any questions um, for Jen today? Okay. Um, Paula, were you raising your hand? Yeah, hi, Jan. I'm the manager of social work here at Avenida's uh, program for caregiver uh, care partners. So we run multiple family caregiver groups. Do you run um, support groups for your, for your We members? do have one support group um, called the Circle of Care support group that we took over from um, Bill Wilson Center. And so we, that is on Monday nights from 7 to 8.30 p.m. via Zoom. And I can uh, share that link with, uh, with Thomas and he can send it out to folks as well. Is that for all ages? All ages, um, as long as people are living with HIV, they can join us. Okay. 
Thanks, Jeff. Mm -hmm. And by the way, folks, I'm going to put in the chat the link for the um, registration for this event. Um, and I noticed, you know, we had uh, 28 people, but only 15 people registered for the event. So I just want to make sure everybody gets to receive the, their um, age ribbon pendant that we're mailing out to everybody who attended today. So um, if you'd like to receive that pendant, um, please follow that link and uh, put in your information so we can mail that out to you. Um, I wanted to thank everybody for uh, joining us today and um, commemorating World AIDS Day, um, remembering our lost loved ones, and, and learning some valuable information to help us not only support and care for those people that are living with um, HIV today, um, but also to fight the stigma that still exists um, surrounding uh, HIV and AIDS. Um, I wanna thank our presenters, uh, Dr. G, Dr. McGlynn, and Jen um, for their great presentations, very informative, and I appreciate you very much. So thank you for joining us today. Um, if uh, anybody has any questions um, after the event uh, you forgot to ask, feel free to email me and I will get uh, the answers for you. Um, I'm putting my email in the chat right now. And you are welcome to email me with any questions about this event, but also um, uh, at Avenidas, we provide free case management for um, low-income seniors in Santa Clara County. Um, we, all, we also do a focus on LGBTQ seniors. So if you know anybody or if you yourself could use some help um, navigating the challenges of aging, uh, please uh, reach out to me and I will uh, be more than happy to help you. Um, so thank you all for um, joining us today and you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Thomas. Bye-bye, guys. Okay, I can't end it.